Thank you all for your presence and for coming to celebrate with us. I want to say a special welcome and thank you to Dr. and Mrs. Ortiz, the President and First Lady of our university. It is a delight to have you joining us for this talk in honor of our anniversary celebrations and for being a constant support to our students and alumni. Our special guest speaker this afternoon fills me with awe, admiration, and I have to admit, envy. He's an astronaut. <laughs> I don't think there's a single person on Earth who does not dream of being an astronaut at some point or seeing our glorious planet filled all at once from the vantage of space. And Dr. Musgrave is an astronaut among astronauts. He served NASA for 30 years, and in that time he flew on six space flights, performed the first shuttle spacewalk on Challenger's first flight, was a pilot on an astronomy mission, conducted two classified Department of Defense missions, which he'll tell us about later, <laughs> and was the lead spacewalker on the Hubble Space Telescope repair mission. I'm personally grateful to Dr. Musgrave for his work on the Hubble repair mission because I'm an astrophysicist. And he was a key person in making possible the image you see behind me. This is the Hubble deep field. And every shining disk you see is a galaxy. Now that picture, the telescope pointed at a place in space that was dark. They thought, OK, let's photograph complete darkness and a very long exposure produce that. It is a part of the sky. If you hold a pin at arm's length, that is the part of the sky it covers. And there are several hundred galaxies there, each with 100 billion stars. You can just imagine what our universe is like. So all our lives are enriched and beautified by such wonderful images and the understanding of our universe that they bring us. And we owe it to the few astronauts who made that possible. So I, I, never, I, I, I never got to be an astronaut, but I am an astronaut. <laughs> in addition to his extraordinary achievements in space, Dr. Musgrave has seven graduate degrees in math, computer science, chemistry, medicine, physiology, literature, and psychology and 20 doctorates for good measure, honorary doctorates for good measure. Story Musgrave is exceptional, but at the same time, perhaps he is not unlike a young person sitting in the audience today. We can all design a life for ourselves, and perhaps like Story, who started on a dairy farm in Massachusetts and went on to walk in the silence of, and the grandeur beyond our Earth's atmosphere, we can all make our own incredible journeys. Since every second I take on this podium is one moment less of story, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Story Musgrave. You're going to help me out, Megan, in time. So that's the very uh, first message I got here is uh, Megan Bienvienti and uh, so Imran uh, Hamid over there. So uh, you go through life and without those people, you're dead. You know, without Megan, I'm dead in the water. I can't go anywhere. Hamid over there. <clears throat> so that's the first lesson I got. Now I'm going to give you a whole bunch of lessons, <clears throat> but we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. So uh, the number one thing we're going to do is fun. Fun. If you're not having fun doing what you do, you've got to find something else to do. If you're not having fun in life, get another life. <clears throat> because fun means you're excited, you're passionate, you own what you're doing, you are possessed by it, and you do it right, and you're excellent. It gives you the energy, you know, to pursue the details. and. Uh, and get it right. 
And so we're going to have fun. But I got a special lesson tonight, and that is how you design a life for yourself. And so you go through life, and it's one opportunity. What is life? It's one opportunity after another. And so we're sitting here like this today. And you see what opportunities come your way. What doors do you want to go into? You look at your skill set. You look at what you're good at. You look at what you want to do. You look at where your passions are. And you say, I'm going to do this one. That's the next mountain to climb in the way you go. You climb that mountain. <clears throat> and okay, here I am. What's the next step? So you can go through life at just one little step at a time. But the story tonight is how you go from child labor as a farm kid, how you go from a farm kid to the one that uh, was the lead mechanic to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, in the 1930s, <clears throat> I did not want to be an astronaut. I did not plan on fixing that telescope in the 1930s, to 40s, to 50s. Life happens. Get ready and get on the playing field, and stuff is going to happen. So the basic model I'm going to give you is the playing field. You get dropped on a playing field. Uh-oh, I've not been on this one before. What are the rules of the game? What do I have to know? What requirements are imposed upon me to get the job done, to live up to the world's expectations? <clears throat> it's nice to live up to what the world expects you to. So I'm going to take you on a journey. How one playing field after another, you get dropped on it. So what do I do with this? What do I have to know? What is the desired outcome? How do I get there? So life is a series of opportunities. I am what I am today. What is the next opportunity I choose, the next mountain to climb? And from there, you're always connecting the dots to your past. You connect the dots to your past all the time. Megan over there, I'm going to pick on her most of the night. I'll pick on her president too, probably some. <clears throat> The fact she's doing AV and she's into technology is incredibly important. She doesn't know where she's going. She does not know where she's going to be 10 years from now, but she's going to put that stuff to work. That's the way life works. You're always connecting the dots to your past. What skill sets <clears throat> do you have? So I'm going to take you on that kind of journey, how you design a life for yourself. How do you get from being a farm kid uh, to being a lead mechanic to fix the Hubble Space Telescope? What kind of path do you take? Always connecting the dots to your past. Always working on your strengths and working on your passion. So you're going to kick the... Start the video? Yeah, you can kick that off, Sukito. This is just a quick... <clears throat> it's a three-minute look at the final place we're, we're trying to go. Now, are you running the lights, too? Megan, you can... They just got a little glare going back their way right now, so you may want to dim the glare they got up there. Do you know the spotlights? <clears throat> so I'm just going to show you the final where we ended up here, working out there. And you can just click on play there or enter, Megan, and uh, away we go. Uh, so this is yours truly, 400 miles. I'm about 400 miles in the air over there, over northwest Australia, working on that machine out there. This is a very nice place to work. <laughs> we I designed that telescope. This is outrageous. From the elbow camera right now. Oh, listen. From the inside continent to Australia, from here. The whole thing. Okay. 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 The sun and I streaking through the sky. And this is a poem. Set down upon Australia. A poem that I published in National Night Geographic. Night down to earth below. <clears throat> All too soon, this serene, silent fall through the night has moved the sun to the eastern horizon. Sunrise. Another day. Another journey began. The earth beckons. And I follow. Okay, Sukito, so then we'll uh, go from there to the, thank you, go to the PowerPoint. Uh, so that's where we're going to end up going. I designed Hubble for 18 years. They told me 1975 story, yes, sir. We're going to put a big telescope in space. We want you to identify every possible thing that can go wrong with every failure, and you come up with the tools and the procedures to fix it with a space walk. 
I could have done it robotically, but they asked me to do that with a space walk. So for 18 years, I identified every possible failure that machine can get into and what I'm going to do about it with a space walk. Along the way, I did not have a failure that says NASA put wrong mirror in telescope. That was not something I planned on. I wasn't cynical enough yet, but I should have been. <clears throat> and so, a space walk up there, I'll scoot ahead into a, or it's coming, yeah. Oh, it's a, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't reach down there that far, can you? Yeah, slideshow right at the top there. It's, it's usually an F5, too. Does F5 work? Yeah, the, huh? F5. The cursor's not coming on. Yeah. The computer's frozen. Oh, it's frozen? <laughs> <laughs> what happens when the computer is frozen on the shuttle? It's called control alternate delete. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, you have to be ready for every possible failure. <laughs> so, here we go. Uh, you got it going already? Megan, you're a magician. You're a magician. Design a life for yourself one little step at a time. So, that's what I was talking about. It's one little step, and that's what makes life sane for you kids. You look at the total chaos of opportunities out there and you say, gee, I don't know where I'm going to do what to do, all these options, one little step at a time. And it's not just for you kids. Life is not over. Life is not over till it's over. It doesn't matter. 50, 60, 70, 80, you keep going. The next mountain you're going to climb. <clears throat> one little step at a time. So the Kellogg Honors College, 10th anniversary and the 75th anniversary of Cal Poly, we're celebrating all that kind of stuff <clears throat> uh, tonight. Now, this is called the posture of exploration. <clears throat> so, <laughs> the lessons I got for you, you take any three-year-old and drop them anywhere and they're in the game. Are you in the game? I'll pick on you tonight too, I see that. In the game. In the game, the kid's in the game. It's curiosity. On. It, there's nothing there. There's some cockroach. There's some stone. There's some bug. But you see that kid? The kid's in the game. And it's curiosity about everything that is going on. It is excitement about the environment. It is curiosity. And that pushes you forward. The energy for exploration. Uh, so that happens to be me. So that happens to be me. And that's roughly about uh, 75 years ago on my farm. On my farm in western Massachusetts, we had 100 head of Guernsey, milk and cows, or dairy farm. So I didn't get exposed to nature. I was in the pine forest at three, alone at night. How can mom do that? A pine forest is friendly, it looks after you. The pine needles, it's friendly, it's warm, it's nice. There's absolutely nothing harmful out there. So I came in the world and I got exposed to nature. Got my own raft, went down the rivers, but that kind of stuff, <clears throat> now you'll see. So I remember one time, about, I'm about eight or so, and it's minus 12 Fahrenheit there, Massachusetts. Minus 12, and I said, Mom, I'm going out. You know, Mom never said, why? Story, you know it's cold out there? She didn't say that. I said, where, where are you going? No. What are you going to do? No. The kid says you're going out, I'll put all the layers on. So she adding all the layers, tying up everything. And of course, uh, a mitten's a lot warmer, you know, a mitten's warmer than a glove. Mitten and a safety pin here and a safety pin there. So I'm not going to lose that mitten. But it's only in the last few years I found out, you know what mom is really doing when she's doing all this buttoning up? I can't pee. So I can't pee. Now you don't know what you're getting into, did you? I can't get where I gotta get, and if I do, I can't do anything about it. So mom says, I'll get that kid back in the house in an hour and a half. I know how to do that. <laughs> so that's really what she was doing. <clears throat> okay, this is called child labor. <laughs> And I'll tell you, this was real child labor, and I am child labor. I don't wish it on anyone else, but man, I wish it on me. It's who I am. I'm child labor. I'm get the job done, and I'm tough. I'm survival, and I am going to get there. Uh, so <clears throat> at the age of seven, this is uh, 1942, and that's a rectangular hay baler. But 1942, the machine couldn't tie the knots. You know, tying knots with twine, very complicated for 1942. The machine couldn't tie the knot. 
So they put me here on the bench, and I tied the knots when the machine couldn't tie the knots, right there. With all, hey, needle nose pliers, you know, this way, that way, that mm, <clears throat> and get the knot tied. If I get my hands in the wrong place, I'm not going to have them for long. So OSHA not like any part of this business uh, with a seven-year-old, but there is no OSHA. <clears throat> and so, but that's what I did. <clears throat> by the age of nine, I drove everything. I drove every tractor, every truck, and by 12 or 13, left in the mow fields, I keep stuff going. Because I'm learning how to make do. I'm learning how to get there and keep stuff going. Uh, so <clears throat> that's what I did there. Now here's the tractor that I drove at the age of nine. We got any red people in the crowd? Any red people? That's called farm all. Fess up. What if I said any green people in the crowd? Okay, I see green people. Don't worry, I got four John Deere's too. I got a red. I'll, I'll have to admit I got two orange. That's called Kubota. So I got the whole thing. But today, I run a landscaping company. My basic model is to take five-acre parcel of land to put three acres of lawn in the middle, exotic trees all around the side, like that. That's my model. So I'm a landscaper today. I'm a landscape architect, and I do that. I do the manual labor. I run the equipment. Huh? What's this? I'm a farm kid, remember? I know how to do that stuff. When I touch it, it grows. It turns green. I'm connecting the dots to my past because I'm a farm kid, okay? The lesson. It's not just what you're passionate about, what you're good at. Don't ever forget what you're good at. Don't forget what you did as a kid. Because when you learn something as a kid, it's very different. You take up the piano at five, you take it up at 50, you know the difference? The great champions of the world took that thing up at the age of three. So what you took up young <clears throat> matters. So this is me and my farm all in. That's the same thing I drove back in 1944 when I was nine years old, but I'm doing it today. So life comes around, you'll see, <clears throat> like that. <clears throat> now that's a little story. Uh, so this is big story. That's big story and that's little story. So I have seven children and uh, the oldest are in their 50s and I have a 26 year old and I have a seven year old called little story and I need to say so far. Remember my lesson? It ain't over till it's over. <laughs> so what's the next mountain you're going to climb, right? Keep moving. <laughs> so keep moving. But at the age of two weeks, uh, she started riding all my landscaping equipment at the age of two weeks. Now, two weeks, I have to cradle her. When she turned two months, I took her car seat out of the car, and I would strap her car seat to the hood of all these various pieces of equipment. <laughs> so she'd been riding right there. And why don't I show a picture? Mom is somewhat tolerant, but she says no pictures because what you're doing is not normal. Uh, so, no pictures, because, you know, this out the door is going to go. But so, little story, she's been riding this stuff. She's been riding that stuff since, uh, since two weeks old. Okay, here's a little story. At the age of six, she soloed on a 500cc all-terrain vehicle. And the neighbors trust that came with her. So, now this is really important. The kid is getting mechanical world. She's massively digital. Yeah, she goes through the house like this. She got an iPhone, iPad, that comes automatically. What I'm giving the kid is the real nature world. I'm giving her nature and I've given her the mechanical skills. She's learned the engineering and mathematics. So you think about that. When you raise kids and people tell me it's real important to include the kids in your program story because they're, they're sort of a blank slate. Not totally, but they're sort of a blank slate. They're learning something, you know, the environment, even the environment in the womb. They're picking up something. So they got the genetic makeup and then what environments, what scenarios do you put them in to develop themselves? Little story is getting the mechanical stuff. She getting the mechanical stuff. So you think about yourselves now. You're not a blank slate, but every single scenario you put yourself in in that experience, you say, I'm a new person. Now, where do I go next? And so that's what it's, <clears throat> that's what it's about. And that's my little kid. At 87 at Bryce Canyon. Now, this is what you got to produce. You must have confidence. You must have optimism. You have optimism. You have to look. The world is okay. The world's a good place. I'm going to be able to go there. I'm going to get the stuff. It's optimism. That is essential to life is a positive outlook. You have to have that. Leaders have to have the confidence and a positive outlook. The leadership got to have that. So this is what you're trying to create. Yeah, she's a little sassy, but that's okay. 
<laughs> but that's what you want. That is why you're trying to make an individual like that. So that's where you're trying to end up. <clears throat> now she's bouncing. I'm trying to give her some zero G. The new movie just came out, Gravity. But I, I got a lot of zero G too. But I'm getting her some zero G on her trampoline. And that's how I get the hairdo. Because she's up in the air. See, she's zero G. And I'm trying to get a great, great picture of a great hairdo. But the sassy little thing says not so fast, daddy. So that's a little story. <clears throat> so you come in a world like this. And it's the cosmos you got. It's the totality of the environment that you have. It's Mother Earth, it's the stars, it's all the rest, all the kind of environments. They are all scenarios that develop you. But don't forget that world. There's two worlds. There's the human code that feeds you human information, and there's the natural world, the cosmos that gives you the natural. So don't forget that part of the world. We're starting to get more and more into the human code. There's a huge amount to learn about your ultimate instructor, <clears throat> which is the cosmic uh, code. <clears throat> So I'm uh, getting into another scenario. So I'm running this landscape company, and I saw a truck going down the road. A truck going down the road, and these are people that prune the trees off the power lines. So they ride up there, seeing the trees growing in the power lines, they prune them off. The limbs come down, they chip them up, and they go in the back of the truck. They smoke. And so out of curiosity, I asked him, I says, uh, where are you going with that stuff? We're going to the landfill. I says, what? Landfill? That's called a dump? Yes, sir. We have no choice. We got nothing else to do it. You are putting this unbelievably biological, organic material in the landfill. I said, that's all right. And I said, well, I suppose you have to pay to do that? Yes, sir, we pay him $50 for every load. Hey, dump it over here. You see the three acres I got? Just dump it there. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it yet, but dump it over there. It doesn't belong in the landfill. Dump it over there. <clears throat> and then they say, well, could we come back tomorrow? Sure, dump it over there. And then they say, well, we have friends. So we have friends. <clears throat> and, and, so they're coming and they're coming, and we end up with this. I don't know yet, but I know it doesn't belong in a landfill. And there's that little dirt girl. So story, story is a dirt girl. <laughs> She's a dirt girl. She's into nature. You know, when it's raining hard, and this is serious now, this is real serious stuff. When it's raining hard, the iPad cannot hang on to her. She's out in the mud puddles. she got to play in the mud. I see a dirt girl. So all I'm doing is balancing, balancing the equation. That's what I'm doing. She's going to be naturally green. She's going to be an engineer, mathematician, digital, the whole thing. Just trying to balance, <clears throat> balance her world. Well, the developers are pushing on me now, the developers. Because I'm only seven miles from Disney World, but I got my 140 acres. I'm doing all my landscaping. Development is pushing on me. Now, the developer got to take the whole thing down. <clears throat> they got a blueprint to put in the ground. They take the whole thing down. Well, this organic material called muck, it's because in Florida, stuff grows fast and it can decay. You cannot put a house foundation or road on that because it settles. So I see all this muck, that incredible black soil. I see it going by the road. Where are you going with that? We're going to the landfill. You're taking that stuff to the dump? Yes, sir. Dump it on my place. Just dump it on my place. So we're dumping everything on my place, and that's a pile starting to build. That's a military dump truck, six-wheel drive. For those of you who like machinery, it's a 9068. It cannot fail. It has, doesn't, there's no electrons. So I've had that thing for 14 years and never broken down. I only paid $12,000, $12,000 for a truck, six wheel drive, that'll haul 20,000 pounds off road. Got it on eBay, that's where you get this kind of stuff <clears throat> these days. So that's my pile. My compost pile of all this stuff peaked out taller than the ceiling of this auditorium and a whole acre in diameter. So that's why I'm, I'm composting this stuff. It's 160 Fahrenheit in the middle of the thing. So here I'm taking the pile down. <clears throat> I have to build a road. You see how incredible fertile it is? That's my cat excavator, and I do all the maintenance on that too. Today, I do the maintenance on all this stuff. I take care of that stuff. If I'm stupid enough to throw a track on it, I put it on by myself <clears throat> in half an hour. Now, for Walt Disney, for five years, I helped them design their ride systems. I design ride systems which are maintainable, simple, robust, they're not going to break because I do that kind of stuff. I bring a different thing to the table. So you say, I just mess around with equipment and that's the end of it, it's not the end of it. You go to Walt Disney, you get a job. It's different than a PhD in mechanical engineering. You bring a different thing to the equation. You bring a different talent than they got at the table. You know, so you see the lessons I'm giving you. You never forget that you can do that, and you did that in your history. You'd be surprised <clears throat> about where that can take you. 
So this incredible stuff, <clears throat> after two years of rotting it and clawing it and taking it, taking that huge pile down, this is what I end up with. The most manageable, fertile, it's unbelievably fertile stuff. So the whole community dumps their stuff in my place. Two years later, they come back and they pay me $400 a truckload to take it away. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'm in the rotting business, you see. Now here's my tree farm. So I have raised 8,000 trees in the last few years. That's one of field out of five. I'm a farm kid. That's what I do in life. It's one of the things I do. <clears throat> now developers are pushing on me. Yeah, I heard a ah. Who said it? Who did the ah? Who, who, where? That's you, sir. You know what's coming, don't you? No. Yeah. <laughs> do you do tree spades? <clears throat> Okay, sir, I know you're right, too. <laughs> you're going to spoil my punchline. Developers, they got to take everything down because they got to put their blueprint, you know, on the ground. <clears throat> everything got to come down. So they tear the trees, tear all the trees down, they put the trees and they burn the trees, but they only got them half burnt. So they got a terrible mess to haul off to the dump. <clears throat> it's a mess. So I got the idea, I'll just carry the trees away for them. So I got the world's biggest tree spade. If nothing else I do in life here, I think big. So you back up against the tree to circle around, I got 12 foot blades. So it makes a hole in the ground, lifts it up like that. So I went to developers, I'm gonna pick the trees I want. I said, can I just carry those trees off? Instead of wiping them out, you know, and burn them, I said, I'll just carry them off. That's a great idea. Will you pay me $100 for every tree that I take away? Yep, uh, that is fair. <clears throat> well, I'll take the trees away and I put them on my place. The same machine will dig the same hole. I drop the tree in there. A little four horsepower behind the pump, I'll water them, and that's all. Now, two years later, when the development is done, and by specification, to have to replant trees back there, I'm just half a mile away. You want some trees? We sure do. They pay me $500 a tree to bring the same tree back. <clears throat> no, it's $600 a tree, just for borrowing a tree for two years. So that is called an, an unexpected target of opportunity, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> now that's my house right there. I built this lake. I dug that lake. I grew all of these trees here uh, from seeds. I shouldn't be saying this. You know the Huntington Arboretum in San Miramar in Pasadena? Well, I have 40 species from the Huntington growing on my place in Florida. It's called a video camera bag that does not have a video camera in it. It has seeds in it. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we did a full circle. We did sore, we did a full circle. Farm kid doing the same stuff today. So, <clears throat> but I never finished school. Uh, the bus left me off at the barn, picked me up at the barn. So I had no books, I had no homework. I'm just working a barn, it's the only thing I got. So me and the books part of the company. If I had a great mentor in school to look after me, they'd have realized the life that I had outside of school looked after me, but I did not. <clears throat> I fell by the wayside. So I never even finished school, but Korea came up, and I went off and I joined the Marines and went to war. And I hope someday we don't do this anymore. We, we can't do this anymore. We have to stop doing what you see in this picture. We have to stop doing it. We the species, you know, we got to get along with ourselves <clears throat> and establish a peaceful global community and look after Mother Earth. But this is me at the age of 17. <clears throat> and that's called vertical. It's the most accurate thing we can do. We had no guided bombs, no guided missiles. You know, your trajectory of the airplane, you drop the bombs off and they go somewhere. It's incredibly inaccurate. You drop the rockets off, they go wherever they're pointing. We came on this idea of verticality. If you're absolutely vertical above the target, you can't miss seeing the vertical because it's where you're going to hit if you keep going. <clears throat> uh, so it's like that. That's called the verticality. We can absolutely vertical and drop the stuff off. And so we're chasing our own bombs down towards the earth, you know. The bombs are falling, we're just slightly slower than they are, right down into the target. And so, <clears throat> that's what we did. That's what I'm doing in life. Now that's the motor I looked after. 3,000 horsepower. I was engine mechanic. <clears throat> uh, now of course, what are the Marines gonna do with me? I'm already a mechanic. But I knew the difference. I'm incredibly creative on what's wrong, what I gotta fix. But you never touch an airplane, unless it's the way they taught you or by the book. You have to do it right, because there's a pedigree of process, there's a whole bunch of engineering, and there is a history as to what works and what doesn't work. You have to do it right. <clears throat> so, within about three months with the Marines, 
I became a crew chief, they assigned me three airplanes of my own. I own these airplanes, they're mine. I take care of the engine, I coordinate all of the maintenance, and I am the one that signs off 300 items, and I say, this airplane is certified to go to war. And I did that at age 18. I am certifying military airplanes to go fly. <clears throat> That's my flight line in K-6 Korea. I don't have a hangar. I have to work with his stands in the mud to muck. I have to do things right with an 80 Sky Raider, not there. <clears throat> and that's what I look like with that kind of responsibility. So after Korea, went well, on board a carrier, and that was to watch this Meyer plane. That's Meyer plane you're looking at. It's mine. I own it. I'm responsible. I walked the pilot out, strapped him in the way you go. And you notice those of you that know carrier stuff, there's no catapult. The cables that sling you off, you just fly, to, fly the airplane off. <clears throat> so, this is incredibly romantic stuff. If you don't get enough out of the system, if the wind is not enough, the carrier is not going fast enough, you end up here. So that pile's going to get out. <clears throat> gonna... But my brother was flying the same airplanes off the same carrier. He went in the water, but the carrier ran over him. Uh, so he did not get out. That's what I've been doing. <clears throat> my whole life, really. I left the Marines the high school poem. I can't get anywhere. I can't go anywhere. And so I took a flying, there's still no space program. There is no space program. I don't know. Don't know where this is going. So I took up flying. <clears throat> I did the best I could. I got all the ratings. I just like doing this. I like airplanes. I like flying. That's my Beechcraft T-34, surplus trainer. I did air shows. I started doing air shows because that paid for all my flying. I'm making a huge amount of money, a lot of money having fun. So that's my blanket of cash and I do air shows. And air shows, what you got in your leg? You turn the page. The first page is what you do approaching the airport. The next page is a diagram of the maneuver and the airspeed and altitude you have to hit throughout the maneuver. That's called air show. It's discipline. It's procedures. Being the best you can. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you have to do that kind of thing right. I did sailplanes too. And that's motorless flight. Having been in instrumentation in the Marines, I designed an instrumentation system for this sailplane. That's my own sailplane. That sailplane set three Texas state records. That's the good news is. The bad news is I was not in it. A friend borrowed it for the weekend <clears throat> and got the records. <laughs> so... I did about a thousand of these. I have no stories. I have no stories to tell you. It's called right. You do things right. It's best practices. Whatever you do in life, do it right. And then go forward to the next, the next playing field. You do it right, because now you learn. Do it right. Procedures, the best practices. What are the best practices within this discipline and this industry? And that's the way I'm going to do it. I have no stories. No stories to tell you with parachute, because I did the procedures. <clears throat> now, I begged my way into college, now Syracuse University, upstate New York. I kept showing up at colleges, turned me down. I showed up there, and I says, I know someone didn't show up, and you've got an empty bed in a dorm and an empty seat in a classroom, and I will, you know, I'll take that for you. So, And finally, they said, you know, Syracuse said, this guy's determined, absolutely determined. So they took me <clears throat> on probation. Well, I want to join the, the active reserve, the Marine Corps active reserve up there in Syracuse to stay with the military, to stay with technology, with procedures, with getting the job done. That's it. Get the job done. I'm still in the game. I'm in this game of getting the stupid job done. I want to join the Marines. Well, the Marines didn't have airplanes in Syracuse. They had tanks. I said, that's okay. I'll drive tanks. So I drove tanks there. I was also a tank mechanic. When my tank broke, I had to fix before they could fill out the paperwork. The mechanic's not very happy. <clears throat> but that's the picture I really want you to appreciate. I really want you to appreciate my tank. Well, I also drove this going to college, you see there. Because you see, I showed both of these, and people, I showed a Corvette, they go, ooh, ah. Hey, I want you to love my tank, not the Corvette. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I drove that going to college, too. Now, you see the thread? It's going to fix the telescope. The whole thread of the farm and the airplanes and the flying and the tanks and whatever. It's going, it, destiny is gone. That's where it's going, because I'm going to show up at the astronaut office and nobody got the skill set that I got. But doing this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so Corvette makes you drive it and it makes you mess with it. You got to tinker with it. Say, story, how can I afford that going to college? I'm making so much money going to college, you got to spend it on some. Or what's a farm you're going to spend it on? Except the Corvette. What is all this money, sir? Well, the Marines of Korea are paying for everything. So the GI Bill from Korea, they're paying everything. 
<clears throat> well, I saw Syracuse, they have a wrestling team. <clears throat> I got to join a wrestling team. So I joined the wrestling team. As a freshman, I made the varsity first, first meet. I'm on a varsity team. I said, what's that all about? Well, I did all the hay bales when I was a kid. You know, 60 pound bales, trying to lift the bales. I did that for years and years and years. Thousands upon thousands of bales. This is real child labor, man. That hay eats. It eats through all your clothes. It eats in your skin. You got blood, you got pus, you got everything. It's just a horrible mess. <clears throat> and you say, the hay bale's not going anywhere. As a freshman in high school, I was undefeated wrestler for four years. The freshmen take up weightlifting, but I got seven years ahead of them and they're never going to catch me. I got them. And if I get a hold of you, you're dead. So you say the hay bales, that's not going anywhere. It's, you know, well, I walk down to Syracuse, it's room, board, and tuition because I'm a wrestler. So the Marines are paying for all the college. The wrestling plan for all the college, and they don't talk to each other, so I got two different ways. <clears throat> and, and, yeah, well, <laughs> it ain't done yet. I'm making all this money driving tanks, and of course, I drove heavier construction equipment. So I'm making four times the money I need to go to college. Got to spend it on something, so you see the trajectory. <clears throat> I major mathematics at Syracuse, complex mathematics, multivariate analysis, stochastic processes, queuing theory, all the rest of that stuff. And I um, went to work for Eastman Kodak. Then I went out to UCLA here. I was at the Western Data Processing Center into computers. But from computers, so I was an operator. No one knows why IBM 650 is or a 709, right? Nobody in this room knows what a vacuum tube processor is. I hope you don't. Oh, sir, you do. Okay. <laughs> well, you're not giving away your age. <laughs> you just know about things. <laughs> so I was a hardware operator, and I was a programmer, and what's called Daytran that went away, but then Fortran, I was an assembler and a compiler. But I got interested in how the nervous system works. A computer works this way. I'm at UCLA. A computer works this way. How does the nervous system work? So I said, leave it alone story. Just leave it alone. You're on the bottom floor of a great job. Leave it alone. No, I can't leave it alone. I'm going to go through the brain. So my goodness, you bail out. It's called a fork in the road. We're going to go do the nervous system. Pre-med, off to medical school in Columbia. And I'm heading for neurosurgery and neurophysiology. That's where I'm heading right now. As a freshman in medical school, I published five significant papers. I am so radically pragmatic, you can't stop me. I'm going to get the job done. So a neurosurgical research lab, I was getting the job done all the time, so they put me on the papers. But then, oh my goodness, what is this? Uh, so I'm trying to do neurosurgery. I think I got another good job, and now space flight happens. And the National Academy of Science and NASA want to put someone in space that's got formal education, got a doctorate too propose experiments and conduct them up in space. I looked at that and I said, oh dear me, everything I have ever done in life is going to fit that job. You get ready and life happens. I'm ready and life happens. So you're there. <clears throat> you say, leave it alone, story. I can't leave it alone. It's a big fork in the road. <clears throat> so... <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but, sir, it's funny, uh, sir, right there, I'm looking at you. But this is plagiarism. I plagiarize everything. <laughs> that fork is in Pasadena, California. I don't know why it's there. It's contemporary art. But I take one look at that fork. I need that for my presentations. It's a fork in the road. <laughs> so you get the picture. Contemporary art or something like that. I saw it's off to NASA. They sent me to the Air Force for a year to get Air Force, Air Force flight training. That's me back in 1968 because I didn't have any jet time. And I came back to this incredible beauty. It's 50 years old in this picture, <clears throat> north of T-38. The only reason they give me the airplane is just so I can demonstrate that I can be the best in the business and the best I can be every second of the day. That's why they give me the airplane, to keep me sharp. Sharp in airspace, sharp as an operator. What are the rules of the game? So it's you and the airplane. <clears throat> if you just go buy a new car, you know, it's incredibly serious. You want to go buy another car, a new one or an old car. It's you and that car, what you're going to do with it? It can turn out incredibly bad or incredibly good. So something new has entered your life, you're on a new playing field. What are the rules of the game? How do you drive this thing? How do you operate this thing? See, 
Even something that small, you look upon that as a playing field and how good can I be with it. And the more you strive to be good, the more you're going to acquire in terms of being excellent and you carry that through in life. <clears throat> Even the kind of small things. But it's incredible beauty. It's 50 years old in this picture, supersonic uh, machine. <clears throat> That's what she looks like when she's a fighter airplane. I looked at this beauty and said, I'm going to carry a camera. I don't know why. But every time I go fly, <clears throat> I'll bring a camera with me. Because you get ready, get in the playing field, life's going to happen. So I carried a camera. Now I was a maintenance test pilot for NASA in that airplane. <clears throat> a maintenance test pilot is when an airplane been on heavy maintenance. You scoop the pieces up together, put it together, I'm going to fly it to see if it works. So I got a maintenance test pilot. I'm the only astronaut in history to be a certified airplane mechanic. Why do I get a job? Because I'm an enlisted Marine Corps mechanic, I get the job of being a maintenance test pilot. It's the stupid hay bales, you know, it's undefeated, it's a scholarship. You don't think a space walker needs a little bit of upper body strength? The hay bales paid off there too. So that's the way life goes. <clears throat> Remember those lessons I'm giving you. It's one little step at a time. Here's some of my photography here. <clears throat> So I like the horizon, you know, the various curves and that stuff here. I just lucked out here. It's my circular polarizer filter and uh, the sunset uh, going on. <clears throat> Airspace is gorgeous. Now, I'm not in those airplanes. I'm in my airplane out here, see. I'm in my airplane, like Blue Angels taking a picture. You see there. <clears throat> Here's the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. Uh, this is straight up. Of course, that's what they want you to do. Push hard. Push the airplane hard. Push you hard. That's how you can demonstrate excellence and learn something. Here's Mother Earth. But I use the same kind of thing. So I'm in this airplane taking a picture there, you see. But you know, you know what I use these pictures for? When I go and talk to the investment community, the real estate community, I says, do you all know what a bubble is? If you keep going up long enough, you're going to do that. So that's what a bubble is. And now they get it. <laughs> you got to pay attention. That thing will eat a huge amount of altitude. You think you're two miles high and you're safe, you're not. So you have to pay vigilance attention. So I'm going to stay positive. I'm not going to do lessons tonight, but two of my buddies did not pay attention. And in the water, they went in the water to go from Mexico there. Now, I'm, do, I'm doing a book. I mean, I'm doing a book at this time. I know I'm doing a book at this time. So I'm kind of cheating here, but I had the mechanics give me a perfect flight line. I'm going to do a book to celebrate the airplane. But I got a shuttle launch going off at night. So when it goes off at night, it's going to light up my beauty. So people say, cheating story. Well, that's okay. I cheat. Say, so look what I got. <clears throat> See, I got it. So the airplane's going for the book. Here's the daytime picture. Same thing. Shuttle back, shuttle launch background from my airplanes. But look what the plume did. Can you believe the plume turned into this? Three-dimensional structure? That's just outrageous. Spectacular. Plumes do that now and then. So, but I got a picture. <clears throat> a sunset. The sun's always cooperating. T-38's are leaving. I got this overhead. I'm on the playing field and I'm ready. I'm just on the playing field. Life happens. Get ready, and these opportunities will come. If you're not ready, you cannot take advantage of the opportunities. Look at this stuff. The most powerful rainbow. Do not mention Photoshop. I have the transparencies. <laughs> the most powerful rainbow I ever saw in my life is surrounding my beauties on a Sunday. That's why there's no one working there. I parked my airplane, and I left, and I turned around, and I saw this. I had the camera. I had the camera and I was there. So life happens if you're ready. So I ended up doing a book to celebrate that NASA Northrop T-38. I did join NASA two years before Apollo flew. The magic of Apollo was how simple and how beautiful it was. Candy said go and he said do it in eight years. That eight years was essential. It was nuts in a way. What, eight years? We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the technology. We don't know anything. You think we get to the moon in eight years? It was impossible. We did it. So that urgency, the urgency of the timeline was important. But we chose a simple technology. We cannot choose a complex technology because we simply won't get there on time. So there's Dr. Von Braun and his incredible F1 engine. When he was told we're going to the moon in three years, just three years of Saturn lifted off, the man was unbelievable. And so I knew him exceedingly well, exceedingly well. So his dream was space flight, of course. He trained with the world's experts, Herman Oberth, as a teenager. But, of course, the Germans wanted him to send a V-2s to London. He didn't want to do that, but if i got to do that to get into space flight, I'll, I'll hold my skills doing that. But he came to this country in 1945. 
He wanted to do space flight. Unfortunately, we in the U.S. would not let him do space flight either. We wanted him doing missiles, so we didn't get to do space flight here either. But he was cheating. He built orbital capability into the missile he was dealing with, and they caught him. So they put ballast in his upper stages to stop the man from going into space. We would have been there in 1950, seven years ahead of Sputnik, if we had had vision. It's called vision. It's called space flight is exploration. It's romance. It's philosophy. It's one of the big questions. It's history. Space flight is not international competition. That's not what it is. It's not geopolitics. Space flight is science and exploration. But we missed. We didn't let the man do it. We gave other people a shot, too. Once we told him we need to be in space, it only took him two months to do the job. So that's called a vision. And this is the right machine for the right job there. Uh, so that is termination. That is leadership. That is belief. It is possession. It's an incredible communicator and a believer, a great project manager, a great engineer. You want to go somewhere, that's where you need to go. <clears throat> so I've been preaching simplicity, the simplicity of the airplane, the simplicity of Apollo. But all of you in this room are living this world, and that is complexity arising. Complexity arising. So Intel asked me to come to Hillsborough, Oregon, and to give them a half a day symposium on where the world was going. I says, oh no. <laughs> Not that dumb. <laughs> Intel? And tell them where the future of the world is? I said, I don't have anything to offer. Flat, flat in my face. Musgrave, get up here. You'll do all right. Get up there. You know what I did? I simply reverted back to my days at UCLA when I was playing with the interaction of the nervous system and the, and the world, the vacuum tube back then, playing with that. And I went back and got the idea of complexity arising. And so supernova events are the only thing we know in a cosmos that makes big molecules, big molecules you need for life. So biochemistry and the chemistry of life is big molecules the way carbon hooks to itself. <clears throat> so supernova events, DNA and RNA, <clears throat> I do not think that's a cosmic imperative. I think it'll be other kinds of reproductive systems, but I do think that life, the way carbon hooks to itself is the essence. But what is happening, what all of us got to live in, so that is plants under a microscope in the nervous system, and that's the silicon world. So there's a tighter, tighter connection between biology and the silicon world and the silicon world get more and more complicated all the time. So every one of you are living in this world. It's a natural trend for complexity to arise. And some people look at me, sorry, that's not the way entropy works. Entropy is supposed to run downhill. Yes, but the sun is pushing it uphill. It's the sun that makes for the complexity. So that's what's happening. Complexity arises. Every system on the world and everything is going to become more and more complex. And what do you do with that? So there is a birthing of complexity. For the symbology I did, that's a vacuum tube. That's a vacuum tube. This is the Gutenberg Bible written out here. I think that same silicon complexity is in all the planets out there conducive to life. So I think if I ever get out there and we find a planet with life on it, as life evolves and gets more complex, I think we'll find the complexity of the silicon world out there as well. I think that may be a cosmic imperative. So the world gets more and more complex. <clears throat> now I pursued a citation to see if it might be adjunct to a T-38. But the magic of this was, the newness was, 100% of my training's in a simulator. The very first time I saw a Cessna citation was my check ride. So that's what the world has gotten to, uh, complexity and the virtual, the virtual world. Now, that's what an A380 looks like. So that's your, your Airbus A380, an incredibly complex machine. Now, flying is so simple. Flying is angle of attack. So that's the airplane, mostly the wing, and here's the oncoming air. But that's why an airplane is what it is, and it's why it flies. It's only angle of attack. There's nothing else but angle of attack. That's angle of attack. If you're heading that way and your destination is there, you take the angle of attack to pull yourself to there. That is the totality of flying. Now that lift creates drag and it takes a motor to oppose the drag. That is the totality of flying. Angle of attack and thrust and engine. So we have to do all of this to try to manage two things. Angle of attack and thrust. Now you talk about what well, we got to navigate, sure. How high am I above the earth? Little handheld GPS, where am I? Put in the latitude, longitude, where I want to go. There's the heading, there. 
So that is the totality of flying. It takes this then to do those simple things. So we get more and more complex all the time and we start to lose the essence of things and we don't do it right. Airbus is wrong. They are wrong to put the stick over here. They're simply wrong. Who is Story Musgrave to say Airbus is wrong? Well, I'm just a human factors person. I guarantee you, you can ask any human factors usability expert on the whole earth and they will say, you should not force the captain of the, this airplane to land with their non-dominant brain. So left and right handed, this is not just hand, this is which brain is dominant. You should not force the captain to land with a left hand, they're wrong. And also, when I do surgery, my trauma surgery, I don't do surgery over here. I do it here. That's the way the body designed. So you're flying over here with the, the non-dominant, the left hand. So they're wrong. So it just shows how our industry can get into cultural failure, how design can get into a failure. As complexity, as complexity arises. So I'm getting checked out of citation now. I can't afford it. But I trade, I trade, I trade lectures in, for aviation safety for free simulator time. So that'll keep me sharp. I'm always trading off some. <clears throat> Shuttle turned out to be much more complex than we expected. It was so vulnerable, so fragile, so difficult to operate, but it made us good. It was so difficult, you know, it made us good. That's all I can say about that. And so only it could have put the space station together the way it did. Only it could have served to carry up the telescope and to serve as a work platform, <clears throat> not to myself, to work on it. So on to the telescope. We're going to end before 6.30, right? So, Kita, yeah, okay, I got 25 minutes to go. I will make it. So, the telescope, and like I said, 1975, they told me look after that machine, identify every possible failure, and do that with a spacewalk like this. But here's the way I got to do it I got to do it looking like that. So, I got to do all the tasks looking like this. That's kind of gorilla like. But the other thing is, it doesn't have the same body I got. I got a wonderful shoulder joint, 360. That's good news is, my suit does not have a shoulder joint. I got one, but it doesn't. So the suit's got its own body, you got your body, put the two together, you try to work. And of course, it's got a huge amount of, not weight, but mass. It's 480 pounds on Earth. So if I think I'm gonna be a nimble squirrel and get going somewhere, I have to get 480 pounds of mass going. And once I get it going, I need to look for how I'm gonna stop on the other end. <laughs> If I don't have a place to stop, it's really bad form, you know, to keep going. So, but that's where I got to work. So how would you like to be changing out memory chips? How would you like to change out a motherboard looking like that? Well, why would you? Well, Hubble lost 50% of its memory, so I changed out a motherboard. You screw up one pin, it's dead. Just fly away, leave it. Trash it, leave it. You just trash it and leave it. Come back on the next mission to take care of your mistakes. So that's a criticality of things. <clears throat> So at first, I have no drawings, I got no hardware, and I use artist concepts. That's the big camera that brings you to visit. That's the WIFPIC. Where's my astrophysicist there? There's a couple up. That's, uh, that's the WIFPIC there. Now, this is a high fidelity arm. See, I don't have anything physical. It's called rapid prototyping. I want something physical. Check things out. This is a high fidelity arm. That is a very high fidelity robotic arm of the shuttle. But I had them build me a balloon telescope. So that's a balloon telescope. I want any physical kind of thing to check out my procedures. And here's the styrofoam instruments I had in there. Now, it's a high fidelity arm, but it's not certified to carry humans. So I came up with a balloon story. So I carried story, <laughs> you know, to the various places to start getting some fidelity on my procedures. As soon as I got components, I had the engineers that built the components helping me do that job. I want all the stakeholders. I ended up with 12,000 procedures. So over 18 years, I came up with 300 tools and 12,000 pages of procedures to fix anything that might go wrong. So that's the work that we did. I got a real telescope. I played in the real telescope, took the components out, reinstalled them, all that stuff. Uh, so here's the telescope down at Kennedy Space Center. It's just a gorgeous machine. And of course, it's so powerful only because it's out there. It's an absolutely clear view. And here's an, it's in a canister on the way to launch pad here. But I'll show you this picture. I got the bobcat down there asking what we're doing in lot. And so there's the deployment. I was not on the mission to carry it up, but it was a mission control, a capsule communicator to carry it up. Within two or three months, we had to uh, fess up to the S word, the spherical aberration. We put the wrong mirror in the telescope. 
Uh, so this was an egregious, negligent error, and uh, it's, it's a worthy read for all of you to go on the internet, Hubble Mirror Accident Report, you'll get a 70-page PDF on how not to live life and how not to do things. It's incredibly instructive to do that kind of thing. To really shorten the thing, a laser instrument from a very precise point from the mirror is going to run the polishing machines out there. And so they got to calibrate this laser. So they had a meter stick like, like the one in France. This is the gospel at a very close temperature. But the, the problem is they based the whole thing on a single, a single measurement at one instrument. But they had this meter stick like this and it had the laser. And to protect the bar, they put a cap on the bar with a hole. So the laser come down through the hole and back to the laser, calibrated. Well, they misaligned the laser. So the laser not going through the hole and hitting the bar, it's hitting the cap. And they had abraded the cap so the laser went back. So the measurement they're looking at is not the bar, it's bar plus cap. And they got all hacked off at, the, at this instrument. They got all hacked off at the instrument for not coming up with the right stuff. So you know what they did? They shimmed the instrument with washers. We'll fix you. That's it. No quality, no procedures, no nothing. And no checks. The same instrument that did the polishing, the manufacturer was used for the final check. So we don't have a check. We're not testing anything. Anyway, it's a horrible story. Don't do that. But read the report. 70-page PDF. Lou Allen was at JPL at the time. But I got to fix that now. So I got a mission. Now I can focus on the 13 things that are broke. I got 13 systems that are broke. I don't have to do the whole thing, which I was doing before. So I got a mission, STS. <clears throat> now 61 to go fix that thing. So this is it. Focus and concentration in the moment. It's the team. It's the going to war spirit. You know, it, everyone is in possession. It pulls people together. When you got that Apollo 13, bring them home, go to the moon, fix the Hubble. It is that kind of spirit <clears throat> that pulls everyone together. And so before going to divers, I would like to have a huge facility with a shuttle and a telescope in the back and turn gravity off, but I can't. I cannot turn gravity off. So I used the water to give me some three-dimensional freedom to operate a little bit like a space walker. But it's not perfect. <clears throat> I'm moving stuff through the water. It's viscous. It's difficult to move. And if I go upside down in my suit, I'm carrying my weight on my shoulders. It's not zero G. See? It's not zero G. It's neutral buoyancy. Before I go in the water, though, I look at every diver. And I said, anyone here has got a better way for me to do my work, you show me with your hands. So I was a lead spacewalker for 25 years, maybe he'd maybe been on the job for two months. He's going to get in my face and show me how I should work. He is, because I begged him to. You empower people around you. You want the best solution. You're trying to disempower yourself, because maybe you're stuck on the wrong solution. <clears throat> That's what it's about. When I was in surgery, it's the same thing. You go in the operating room, anyone that's uncomfortable. So comfort is an incredible word. Are you comfortable with what we're doing? Because comfort is not legal and it's not analytical. It's how do you feel about what we're doing? Anyone in this room who is not comfortable with how I'm going, you tell me you're not comfortable. I got a surgical nurse here. You know, a surgical nurse, she's been on the job for 30 years. She's seen what I'm doing in the hands of 100 surgeons 100 times. You do know in that operating room, the surgical nurse is the real knowledge base, not the surgeon. That's it. And so you always turn, you always listen. Ma'am, how are we doing? You're doing fine story, keep going. Or, I don't like this. I wish I could point you in the direction, but I don't know. So you empower people around, come up with the right solution. <clears throat> so I trained in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. Now the real Hubble's up there. I do not, I don't have the confidence in the fidelity of the measurements of the mock-ups they're giving me. So engineering qualification unit was guaranteed in the Smithsonian to have the same measurements. I will do anything to get after the details. So I took that magnetometer that I'm going to install in space and I put it on this engineering qualification unit in the Smith zone to see that everything works. <clears throat> now tomorrow, I'm going to go in vacuum chamber and take what I can of my components and tools in the vacuum chamber at flight temperatures to see that they all work. Well, so the temperature here in Pomona is to measure the air temperature, but out there in space is nowhere. So to make the problem simple, it's purely radiative exchange. What I want is Mother Earth. I want a huge face full of Mother Earth. I don't want to shuttle here and Earth behind and me facing the blackness of space. The blackness of space is three degrees Kelvin. That's minus 480 something. I want Mother Earth to look after me. Even from 400 miles, if I got enough Mother Earth, I will be 59 Fahrenheit on my surface because I'm in purely radiative exchange with Mother Earth. And if I got enough Mother Earth, I'll be 59. It's a great temperature. But the model here, 
Hubble says no sunlight in any open door. At times I had three open doors. Shuttle wants to point his antennas. I had all these constraints, so they wouldn't give me enough Mother Earth. And I said, I can't run. They wanted me to run at minus 170 Fahrenheit. I said, I did not design my tool to run at that temperature, and my hand can't take it. I got some insulation, but not enough. We got no choice, Story. Well, go find some gas. Go find some fuel. I need to maneuver. Story, you just got to go check it out. It's not going to work. It stunk so bad. My hand stunk so bad I had to take temperature breaks to action report. I had to take breaks. Right, and, I had to, and the tools didn't like an eye. At the eight-hour point in this test, my hands got comfortable. Oh, story, your physician, your hands got comfortable. They didn't warm the chamber up because my hands are dead. My hands are dead. You see, that's why they got comfortable. So you see the dead fingers, the living. <clears throat> so you got the late spacewalker, <clears throat> six months before flight. <clears throat> this guy ate dead fingers. They told me to run, just go to the airport. I don't know where I'm going. Go to the airport, story. I sent me to Alaska, the world's frostbite expert up there. He was pretty optimistic about how much I'm going to lose. But when I got back from Alaska, got back in a suit, went back to work. I'm still developing this mission. I still need to train, need to develop the dance, the choreography. <clears throat> People said, story, you can't get in a suit with hands like that. Why not? Because you're going to lose too much tissue. I said, I can shorten the gloves. If I lose too much, I'll shorten the gloves. Okay, we'll still get the job done. People thought that's radical. Well, I have no choice. You know, it's child labor. The child labor is going to get the job done with fingers or without fingers. You know, you want to get the job done, send a Marine. That's who I am. I want to get the job done. <clears throat> so, but we, we got some extra fuel. We got some extra fuel to do the maneuvers, and I wanted to fly that mission toasty warm. So we, we found this test, the problem. So we're going to just have some fun now and go fix Hubble. So here are our formation. These are the Hubble crew, you see. STS-61, the first visit to Hubble. And this wonderful bird's eye view here. Vehicle assembly building where they stack things up. Launch pad A and B. This is gorgeous. Fly the airplane by a, by a shuttle on the launch pad there. <clears throat> Aerospace is beautiful. Your vehicle left California a few months back and flew across the desert. And now I'm going into Florida. Now, at one time, now NASA was going to, to transport the shuttle like from California to Florida. They were going to mount jet engines on the wings and fly like an airplane at huge cost and problems with stability and all. There was a remote control person, not a NASA engineer. He flies model airplanes. He got the idea, you know, of maybe putting a shuttle on a 747. He built him a six foot 747 scale model shuttle. He's flying that around in the air. And NASA got this. says, my goodness, I wonder if we can do that in the real world. That's the way creativity happens. So. Stack that thing up. Uh, so this is gorgeous. This is just, this is marvelous stuff. And before I forget, I, I'm giving you this program. You can take it with you, this PowerPoint. You can have the whole program. So a story must give a hotmail. I'll send you the program, or you can get it from Megan, or put it on, the, put it on your network. I think you're going to put this whole program on the network, too. Uh, so that's a sun, sunrise over the Atlantic, a sunset behind us. I like the reflections there. I always visit my ship the night before I check on my birds. <clears throat> check my birds, symbolic for America, see if they're okay. I'm going to drive down here. I got some other friends at the launch pad. I check on these guys, see if they're okay. <laughs> now that, that is Kennedy Space Center. They're at the launch pad, so I'm not sure what they think about a launch. I guess they use them after a while, but if you work down there, you go to the parking lot in the evening, you look around. If they had, a, if they had a bad day, they expect you maybe to improve upon their day. Now, so this is it, folks. This is what you're doing live. Now, so Troy, he's my suit tech. He looks after my suit, my helmet, my gloves. I went on a journey. He strapped me in a pile, strapped me in all the shuttles, vacuum chambers. That's it. That's 30 years we went on a journey together, and we tried to do it better every time we came together. I like this one here because it reminds you of 2001. So there's no technology, there's no humans. It's the, the reach for the heavens is framed, in, uh, is framed in nature. And these people sent me on, uh, they, these are amateurs. They just took a picture with their, their digital camera and they sent them to me on email. You like these? Yes, I'll use them. So just, beautiful. these are amateur. It just, that kind of thing captures the, the velocity, even though it's a timely exposure. So we're in space now, we go get that Hubble. All right, so 6,000 miles. I think it was about 6,000 miles away I first spotted it. It's over the Earth, but I, I saw it through the air. So the Earth's like that. I'm looking right through the air. 
and I spotted Hubble on the other side of the Earth. So I ran to rendezvous on a personal computer. It's where we upgraded the shuttle system. You tie into the data stream, bring shuttle data into your PC, get the solution, and put it back in the system. So without touching the shuttle, that's where we're able to upgrade that. <clears throat> now, so here she comes. Finally, after 18 years, I got it in the back, getting ready to go to work. And so Congress told us, if you don't fix that thing, we'll be serious about approving space station. They need to know, because space station, a whole bunch of spacewalks, in a complicated walk, you can do what you set out to do. NASA's incredibly embarrassed about having put the wrong mirror in the telescope, and also the 13 major things that are broke. If you buy a new car and it breaks before you get home, it's not because it wore out, it's because of the limit. You know, it's either quality, it's either quality bad or design bad. That's how you end up bad when things break early. So that's what I'm faced with going out the door. Now, so am I feeling any heat about all this business here? I'm not. I'm happy. I'm only going to do the dance to perfection. I'm a ballerina opening night. All I'm concentrating is perfection in the moment. That's what I'm after. Uh, so, but it's a dream. It's the dream of perfection. Uh, so this gal, she had no hope. She's from Siberia. She got no hope. She and her dad said we're going to play tennis. She won Wimbledon at 17. That's the dream, folks. You get the dream and you go for it. And so Allison Barker, space camp, country care from Alabama. There's a reason she comes to space camp and has to get the job done. She knows she's going to be assigned a role. She's on that playing field I spoke about. What are the rules of this game? What's the skill set? What do I have to learn to get the job done? So it's get the job done. And that's what it's after. I used to hug the source secretary, Clayborn Farms, Paris, Kentucky. I'd show up at the barn and say, my goodness, he's here again. He wants to hug his horse. Yeah, but before I leave, I said, sir, it's for you that I live. You gave the most, you worked the hardest. Every one of you signs up for this. It is not what you do. We're not talking horse racing. We're not talking space flight. That's what you sign up for. You sign up for pushing your skills to here. You do what you're good at, and you shove them up to here so you meet the world's expectations, whatever it is. So after 18 years, there I am out there. And these people, I love and adore them. When I work out there, I'm always talking about how it goes and where I am, because I want their help. I want their help all along the way. I want them to know what I'm doing <clears throat> so they can tell me, help me, and be with me. So it's deference to expertise, those folks there. So here, after 18 years, arranging my tools, that's South Australia, Kangaroo Island you see there. Now, so here's the video that you saw at the top of the stack, putting the magnetometers on. That's why I was able to correct now uh, for the uh, call co-star uh, to correct for uh, the wrong mirror in the telescope. Uh, so <clears throat> there was a patient, uh, person taking a shower in Munich, Germany, Mr. Crocker. And in the U.S., the shower heads, you can change the stream or point the stream. A lot of the shower heads in Europe, you change the position of the whole head. He's doing that. He's not used to that. And he said, that's why I'm going to fix the Hubble. So we came up with an optical bench called CoStar, which little quarter-sized mirrors go out, capture the light, correct it, send it to another mirror, which sends it down. So put it in one box, we fix the light for five other instruments. That's a wide-field planetary camera, and it came out of JPL, wide-field planetary camera two. The solar rays were horrible things. We lost 30 minutes of pointing every rev around the Earth because they shook so bad. You go into the sun, they expand and shake. Night cool, and they shake. Uh, so they just shook. We brought up new ones to put on. They're just terrible things. What was the problem with the solar panels? They didn't test them in the sun. A solar panel you put in the sun, and it converts sunlight to electricity, but they didn't test them in the sun. So you have to test things where they're going to operate, right? Uh, so I put the new ones on. They didn't come down, ratchet, wrench. I wanted to close these doors. Very few surprises. Very, very few surprises. I closed these big doors. And that door is four inches higher than this door. So this latch up there, that latch down there. All the scratches down here. I got back on the ground and said, what's with the doors, guys? They said, sorry, we couldn't close them on the ground either. I need to know about that. Let me know. You know, if you're having a problem, let me know. But I had to come along. You know, back on the farm, the come alongs, the big straps, we tie things to your trailer truck. I had two of those to close the shuttle door. So I had flight director, I borrowed one. Jeff up top, me in the bottom. Hell, it alive with two fingers moving the handle. We got all done it, so that's 1993. And so we're on the 20th anniversary. We're going to MIT next month to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this mission here. Talking to President Clinton, it's a moment of melancholy sadness. I didn't come for the victory. I came to be on a playing field. 
I just want to be on some playing field working to get the job done, meeting the world's expectations of who I am is what I like to do in life, and I've lost my baby. I've lost my baby. And so I want to take a quick look. We've done Hubble. Quick celebration of what zero gravity is. Great movie out there now. I haven't seen it yet, but I will. This was an astronomy mission I flew. And so cosmic ray telescope, infrared telescope, X-ray telescopes, UV telescopes. But I was in Coke and Pepsi war, so I kind of concentrated on a can of Coke. Uh, so I ran their experiments, but I saved one can for me. Now, what do you think a glass of Coke going to do in what we call zero G? It's not its free fall, but what do you think a glass of Coke? You think the bubble's going to go up, fizz off at the top? No, they're not going anywhere because there's no, there's no density gradient. But anyway, I'll say one can for me. And so it's not to use their valves. I took the bottom of the can off. So I have a Coke can with no bottom. It looks stupid in the educational video I'm trying to make. I try to pour the Coke out of the can, and it won't come out. See? It won't come out. So I snapped the can off the Coke inertially, so that's 12 ounces of Coke. You see right there. Now, it makes a perfect sphere, and that's why Mother Earth perfect sphere, because it's trying to minimize surface tension, minimize, you know, the capillary attraction. That's a universal shape. Everything out there, everything out there, if there was a liquid or a gas, makes a perfect sphere, including our sun. Uh, so, but anyway, Coke getting big. The fish don't go The Coke's getting big. My buddies are looking. They're going to make a big mess story. So I got my straw, and I'm going in it with straw. That's flat Coke. That's no good. That's bubbles up your nose. That's not good either. So what I did, I spun the coke in front of my face. I spun it up. I said, here's coke to spin it. So the blob is spinning. That's flat coke, bubbles up your nose. The best coke in the universe, you put a straw right down there. So that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> Quick look at Mother Earth, my two big Hasselblads, an incredible panoramic view. I saw Florida and the Blue Bahamas and Cuba. We got to get along. There's no reason not to. These incredible blues, that's 8,000 feet deep. The turquoise is shallow, which reflects in light. Back to your eye. That's New Province now. NASA and Andros there. These are the pyramids from space. Now, you can't see them with a naked eye because they have no contrast, but you can see the shadow, the blackness of the shadow. Uh, so those are pyramids. That's the uh, Grand Pyramids at Giza. And there's Everest, tallest mountain up there. And this is unbelievably the Great Lake of Iran. So Earth is an art form. Earth is an art form. Look at this. And those are the, that's the volcano on Rabal. And Saudi Arabia, all these volcanoes, Earth is just art. It's art. That's gorgeous stuff. And the Galapagos, you think of evolution, you think of the creativity of biology and that kind of stuff. And this one in the southern hemisphere, that's why she's going that direction, that hurricane. Yeah, so we'll take a sunset, we gotta come home, finish up. And there's some cumulus on the horizon. Now once the sun goes down, it's this. So this is the Mediterranean. Of course, this is Italy. And Sicily, that's the toe of the boot and the heel. The Greek islands over there, Malaga and, and uh, Spain, you see, sitting over there. Uh, so, and here's Alexandria and Cairo, the Nile River down to here, and then Haifa up in there. And this is what you see with the eye. You take the time to dark adapt this aurora that you see. Uh, so, that's aurora, pink and green, based on what atoms are recombining. It's almost like you're flying through it. You're not flying through it, but it looks like you are. This is outrageous what you see out the window. Well, now we got to come home. You can be getting ready for the music there, Megan. I'll let you know when. Into Florida here, in this case, home sweet home. You think of all the people who did it right. They took you on the journey, and they took you home safe. They were the best in the business. Uh, so they're going to turn that thing, go around. So how is Hubble doing? And this is before I fixed it, and that's after I fixed it right there. So the fix worked. That's Galaxy M100. That happens to be the first slide, the face on Galaxy that I saw. Uh, so now the shuttle program is done. I'm going to, and uh, Mike Massimino, great spacewalker. There were four missions after my own. They all used my tools and my procedures. So my tools and my procedures were, were vital. They were very simple, robust, and, and the next missions after mine used mine too. So the shuttle's gone. I'll give you a quick celebration of uh, the Enterprise um, going into New York City. So the iconography of the shuttle and of New York City, the way those things play, Central Park, of course, it's going to end up on the Intrepid down here. So we destack it at JFK, and here she is going up the Hudson River. That's the Veranza Narrows Bridge you know of. And uh, this is what it's all about, folks. And that's what it's about. Remember, you can get this PowerPoint from me. This is just gorgeous stuff. 
Now, this is going across the river. It just reminds me of a painting. Now, none of this stuff I got is PowerPoint, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to PowerPoint this one here, you know. So the Statue of Liberty, I'm going to put George Washington on the bow of the boat, probably <laughs> sit, sit right there. <laughs> Life is fun, right? And that's a New York City street. That's the same crane that picked up the Miracle Hudson U.S. Airways. It's going to end up. And so the shuttle is over, but Virgin Galactic, me and Little Story are going to go in space. I think they'll get flying when Little Story's about nine. So my little nine-year-old, me and, me and her are going to try to go into space. I don't know if the community will allow me to expose the little girl to risk. I don't know what they're going to think, but me and Story, we're going to go fly in space. If they're going to let us do it, it's not over till it's over. So now you can start that music, please, Megan. Yeah, my soul. The music is from uh, Vangelis. That's great. They don't have to hear me. They don't have to hear me. That's good, Megan. Mother Earth is an incredible jewel floating in the ocean of space. It's the only home we're ever going to have. And the two sisters. Now, so it's the moon and the earth. The magic of that is a single photograph. It's a single photograph, you say. Mars is going to be there someday. Here's curiosity. Now, the strange geometry is because the sun is directly across from Saturn. They are trying to take a picture of Saturn, and they caught Mother Earth. That's you and I. We're on a cosmic journey now, you see. The sun's been on a huge roll the last month or two, and the horse said nebula, but look at what happened when you take it with a Hubble in infrared. The universe is a spectacularly beautiful stuff. Star birth in Orion, a supernova event creating life, and star death, those are the beauties. They are the artists of the universe. The juncture of art and of science. And the Veil Nebula, and into the land of galaxies. As Sukita told us, we took a picture where there was nothing, the dark sky. Wherever you take the dark sky, it's another thousand galaxies. That's the kind of home that we got. Now, that's your Milky Way galaxy. This is our home. That's what she looks like with a Kobe satellite, the sharpness thing. The Voyager satellites have been out there for 35 years. Most people think they have left the solar system. We turned one around backwards to look at Mother Earth from 5 billion miles. That is our home. That's the accretion disk that formed the solar system, planets, Earth, and you and I. With Walter Cronkite's story, what do you say? What do you say about all this? Three things. I am privileged to have the opportunity. I am privileged to have the call to go. Secondly, I was allowed to finish the job. I could have been stopped. I could have run into overwhelming difficulties and not gotten there. I was allowed to finish the job. And thirdly, it is not over. Space is the quest for the universe. What is the place of humanity? What is the meaning of the hope of the life we got here? It is the quest for being the best you can every second of the day. So with your feet solidly on Mother Earth, your head and your eyes in the heavens, I wish you well on that quest. Calm seas, fair winds, and remember, you go simply because the opportunity is there. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, sir. Well, congratulations on your 10th anniversary, Kellogg, 75th anniversary of college. Remember? Story must be the hot mail. Well. Story Musgrave, a hotmail send program. And I'll send you, send you a copy of this program you just saw. Thank you so much, Story. Uh, this was just fantastic. And, you know, we'll take these lessons as we go into our next decade of excellence for the Honors College and our next 75 years for the university. Um, I want to give you a small gift so that you'll remember us. This is our 75th anniversary. I can't anniversary. forget. I couldn't you possibly can't. forget, no. And a little gift for the time and effort you've spent to come here. Yes. Um, we, we can take questions.
questions. Uh, is that okay? Uh, sure. Okay. And uh, we have a mic back there, so you don't have to come here. And I guess you can turn the lights on so we can see the audience. This has been so special. I yes. want to invite you again to come and visit us. It's kind and of stunning. It's hard to come up with questions when you're up it, to here. It, it, it is hard to come when, up with questions. Are, are there any questions? Is there someone who has a question? Or Ray, back there. The complexity drive us humans out? Well, I think we're part of it. Well, it's always, that's an interesting question, and I don't think so myself, because I think we're creating that complexity. But you can get into the machine world where the machines do their own kind of thing, sure. But we got to control that. I think we need to control the environments we make, not just unleash them on humanity. We need to consider what, what the sociological effects are of the stuff we do, and, you know, and, and keep it in check. But we're not doing that yet. Little story is. <laughs> There's a question there. Don't let none of that stop you. Don't let none of that, just keep going. So you may look, you know, you're going to specialize a major in a field, and you look at the field and you say, it's too crowded now. I can't make a go of it. Don't let that stop you. Follow your heart. Your heart is the only thing that matters. Your passion for doing it right and what you're good at. So follow your heart. That's the passion. That's the motor. And then do what you're good at. And it'll work. Have the faith. You have to have the faith. That confidence and optimism, little story had at Bryce there. Do you know what the motto of our university is? It's learn by doing. Ah, oh, yeah, man, that's great. That is. <laughs> I need that ahead of time. But uh, the whole thing, the whole thing. And so that is, that's learn by doing. But you can also call it scenario-based learning and scenario-based teaching. So you pick out some dramatic experience you had in something and you extract the principles. Okay, I went through that experience. What did I learn and what principle is embodied? But you can call it scenario-based uh, learning and scenario-based teaching. And that is one beautiful way to get it. So you're saying doing, doing is one thing, but then reflecting on it, really, <clears throat> really, really reflecting on yeah, it. Yeah, extract the principle. So what lessons, what lessons, and then look for the principle, and then go into books. So I never ignore the books. So these lessons I have, I've got a whole, a whole library wall. So I'll come up with an experience, and I'll come up with principles, and I'll go into books to see if I have an affirmation. Or I will go into the books first, and then I'll go out and find scenarios that reflect what's in the books. So I do not ignore the books. It's a combination. Uh, it's just difficult. We're we're paying for six different ways to get to space station. We're caught, we're, you know, and we're we're keeping space station alive. Right now, there's no vision, no destination. There's no what, where, when. So NASA needs to create a great vision, and give that to the public, and have the public then get the Congress and administration to support that particular vision. So right now, right now, we're very short on very short on vision. My own approach would be, you know. My own approach would have been, the shuttle didn't turn out the way it's supposed to. It was supposed to be 10 million a flight, ended up being, um, you know, a billion a flight. Uh, so it was very difficult to operate No, but I would not have gone and done, the cost of space station is 300 Voyager satellites. Every one of us could have had a page or three, a 300 different channels 
We could have had landers on every planet and every moon of every planet and return samples for the cost of space station. So that is real exploration. I would have joined the robotic program and the human program and sent the robots first to mature different landing sites here and there before you send humans. And humans can almost go on a one-way trip. They can go safe, reliable, and low cost. Send the robots first. But as a step, what came next, instead of station, I would have sent 300 Voyagers and we would have known the whole solar system. That's been the cost of that thing there. And the, the public is not too sure what space station is doing. There is not that evocative, compelling image of what is going on there. And there's not the evocative story of what kind of real, exotic, cutting-edge science is coming out of there. Like, what does it mean to be a human being? What is biology? You know, what is evolution? The big, the big questions, that's what should, should be coming out of there. But that question, thank you, Bob. I could spend an hour or two on that one. <laughs> uh, there, see, there's a question there. Yeah. I think you mentioned that you worked with uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. Yes. Well, it's my personal dream goal to hopefully one day be a Walt Disney Imagineer, but I had a couple questions. Um, I guess one was, did you actually personally meet Walt Disney? And yeah, my second question was, uh, what work did you do with Walt Disney Imagineering? Uh, so I didn't, um, I didn't work with him. When I joined, I joined uh, Disney at the end of my astronaut career in 1990. Uh, yeah, no, I'm 80. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm almost 80. <laughs> I, I push an 80. <laughs> yeah. um, I did things like uh, Mission Space. Yeah, so I did the movie, Mission to Mars. I did Mission Space. Uh, uh, the technology, it didn't quite go the way I wanted it to. But, uh, so that park, I designed entire uh, theme parks uh, so I could work anywhere. I brought new kinds of technology to the company, which might be applied here and there. But I was with uh, R&D and uh, out there in uh, Burbank and Glendale, so it was a it was a very nice imaginative job, very imaginative job. I ended up moving across the street to a company called Applied Minds. We do the same thing: graphic design, rapid prototyping, new products, new business models for the future. So that's what I, I do that one week a month now, and I also teach at Art Center College for Design in Pasadena. So I teach design up there. I teach simplicity, I teach beauty, aircraft design, I teach uh, landscaping, architecture, of course. Uh, so I teach uh, the experience, the experience, how you experience an object, that kind of stuff. So teaching art center, it, it gives me, a, it's a sounding board between myself and graduate students. It keeps me in touch with the world. What do they think of my ideas? So it's a seminar kind of, you know, it's a sounding board. Uh, so it's a very valuable thing to me to teach at art center. That's something to consider, too, you know, design. Oh, there's uh, one there. And then. Uh, one of my personal dreams is to become an astronaut as well. Um, <clears throat> what would the next step be after college? <clears throat> well, you apply and you get your application in now, and it will get, it'll get updated every year, the next skill. You know, the next thing you acquire, you just you get it, uh, you, you would get it updated. So it's astronaut selection, Houston, Texas, 7705A. Get the forms and fill them out and get it started. <clears throat> but I think the guarantee, <clears throat> the numbers are so tough. The numbers are so bad. In my case, uh, they took 11 out of 6,000. You had to have a doctor to even apply. What I would do if I was you, and I've never had anyone pick up the idea, is to come up with an exotic experiment which is so imaginative and so compelling to the public, they will fly you with the experiment, not as an astronaut, but as a scientist astronaut. So that will dictate that you get on board and you won't be fighting the numbers. So with huge imagination and come up with an experiment which will define, you know, what life is and what it means to be a human. Some really big question kinds of answers, and it's just imagination that's the difference between doing that and not doing that. That'll guarantee a ride. That'll get you around to big numbers. I know it's a big, uh, you know, it's a big task to get done, but that's what I would do. But you can also take the other path, too. And so, you know, what they're looking for is some technical skills, some academic skills. They're looking for you comfortable in other environments like a motorcycle, like mountain climbing, scuba diving, flying, that you're comfortable in some other environments and you're a team player. So three things, technical scientific skills, are you a good team player, 
and are you comfortable in other environments? Just demonstrate you got that. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I had to figure it out all along. So I'm child labor. You know, I had to figure it out. I had to figure out how to survive. And so by the time I got to NASA, it was pretty easy going. <laughs> Train the prince. And all that. I'm not a risk taker. I don't like risk. It makes me sick. Uh, so I'm a professional. And I don't want to lose the vehicle. I don't want to lose me. I want to come home. And so I learned that lesson throughout my career is losing people. So I had two of my airplanes. They were my airplanes. The pilot never came home. I had to put up with that. I lost my brother on the same carrier. And so I don't like risk. I am a professional. And so I like aerospace, and I like space and avian parachutes and all the rest of that stuff, farm equipment, but I try to control the risk. And so I don't like risk. And any time you start to compromise, you know, my ability to control the risk, I get very unhappy, and I don't like where I am. But I'm intellectual about risk. Now, like the Sydney Harbor Bridge climb is one example of intellectualization of risk. You know Sydney Harbor, the, the classical picture of the bridge in the Opera House? Well, at Sydney Harbor, you can walk up. They got this path, and you walk up 400 feet up the bridge. You go across and then down the other side, and you're looking 400 feet to the water, and you look on the city skyline, you're looking at 400 feet to the water, but they got the railing. You, so you got a harness on, and the ring goes on the railing. You can't get hurt if you want to get hurt. It's so impossible. So I intellect, hey, 400 feet of water, I can't be afraid. Because no one has ever been hurt. No one has ever been scratched Sydney Harbor Bridge line. So I intellect, I can't, I can't, I can't be scared. 400 feet of water is just fine. My son and I are going along, and this lady who had to drag her, she was paralyzed. We're dragging her feet along like this. And the guy says, you know, y'all didn't come to do that. Are you okay? Sure, we'll help. But she doesn't understand that she's on the, she's on the ring and she can't get off. The guy got the key, and she can't be hurt. No one's ever been hurt. So that's in the section of fear. They said, I can't possibly be afraid because no one's been hurt. I can't get hurt. So that's the difference between one person and another in terms of, uh, in terms of intellectualization of fear. OK, uh, let's have, uh, there are two questions. Let's have the last two questions. Uh, yes, you, and then back there. Not nice. <laughs> well, the vibrations are pretty impressive. But also, the thing is, they didn't, after the Challenger, and I rode shirt sleeve on two missions on Challenger, that's no orange suit, no escape suit. So before, I rode two on Challenger, of course, before I had a Challenger accident. So you're somewhat comfortable. When I added the orange suit, they didn't change the seat. And so nothing would fit. So you're sitting in a chair like this with an orange pumpkin suit on. It's miserable. Your oxygen bottles are hanging off. They're tugging on your chest. You're supposed to be wearing the gloves, but you can't do the computer. They didn't change the computer interface. You can't do the computer with the big gloves on. And so you take your gloves off against the rules. But you tell them, I can't do the computer, but I have to do the computer. And so you, you get into that kind of business. And so, but I always look out the rear window. Because straight up, you just see the clouds, you're punching through the clouds, you know, and night is kind of nice, too, because the fire, the fire seems to wrap around the front. You see the fire out the front window, too. And so, but I always look out uh, the back window. So the back window is like a video camera just going, shh, you see yourself leaving the launch pad. So before the Challenger, I used to turn around and look out the back window. And if you're in a dragster, you don't look out the back window, you look out the front, but there's nothing out the front except blue sky. You don't see anything out the front window. You look at the back when you see yourself leaving the pad. And so the first two flights I had without the orange suit. When I got the orange suit, I put a big mirror. I had a mirror that size. I had it on my wrist like this. So I could do the computers and get my job done, but I had a big mirror looking out the back window. So I got this stuff. I'm always up to something, right? You can't leave it alone. <laughs> so that's what launch is like. Now it really smooths out when you get on the, when you get on the shuttle made engines. Compared to sound rocket boosters, they're very, very smooth. And they're very, very smooth. They just push. So they're liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Are you afraid at all during the launch fire? I don't like risk. So 
uh, I'm afraid, I'm concerned because I don't like risk. But the fear, I made the decision a long time ago, but I do know what's going on. Uh, so, but the kids are always hooping and hollering. You know, they're always hooping and hollering, the kids. But see, they're not going to stay for another 30 years. They're going to fly, they're going to fly and leave. I got to keep doing this for another 30 years. So the kids are always yelling and screaming about how nice the ride is. And then they ask, how are people doing? <clears throat> So it goes down the line, you know, how are you doing? And it gets to me, and I says, man, this scares the shit out of me. Then it gets quiet. <laughs> the old man don't like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they leave, and I keep doing it. Now, so, uh, so it's, uh, you're not afraid, you're concerned about the risk, but you made the decision years and years ago that that's what you do in life, so you, you keep doing it but you're uncomfortable with risk. And there was a last question back there. Yeah. Does John Madden What? King of the Moon? I don't know. <laughs> that question, do you understand? I, I don't understand the question. But I do, I've watched him broadcast, of course. I've watched him broadcast stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. It may be, but I don't know. And on that note, we will thank, thank you again. OK, my friend. You got okay. your glasses? Do you want some? Yeah, thank you. I'll, no, I'll some get water. that at dinner. Okay. Okay. Well, not that. There's a check yes. in there. Oh, the check, too. Yeah. Well, thank you. to see what we do yet, it's not been measured to 